Don't you ever take for granted the privilege of getting to go to church. That's under attack. There is a reproach that comes with being a follower of Christ. We in America have tried to reshape the whole church so that it's palatable and likable in the culture. A church that is accepted well with the culture is usually not accepted well with Christ. The church is a fortress, and a fortress is strength. A fortress is might. Not only a center of defense, but a place of strategic planning and offense. Our God does not expect us to wait for the darkness to enclose around us. He expects us to take up His banner and fight the darkness with His light. You want to know what the biggest problem with America is? The bull pits in this country. Gave in. Gave in to public pressure. Gave in to political correctness. One of the greatest curses this country has ever had to deal with is political correctness. Preparing the Christian to shine the light against the darkness of this world. Welcome to Our Mighty Fortress Podcast. Hi, I'm your host, Ron Miller, and welcome to the show. We have a very fascinating subject to cover today. But first, please go ahead and hit that follow or subscribe button on the podcast platform on which you're listening to us upon. We have several social media platforms with lots of material that you can listen to and read. Check us out on our fan page on Facebook when you type in at Our Mighty Fortress. You can also check out our website, OurMightyFortress.com. We have a lot of media there that where you can watch videos and read articles and even take a look at our merch store link and be able to support the work. If you do feel so motivated to do- donate to the work that we do here, feel free to do so through our website and the established PayPal link. If we have helped you in some way through our work, please tell us at OurMightyFortress at gmail.com. By following and supporting the podcast, you let me know that you care about the subjects that we discuss. Today, I'd like to bring you a continuation to the series that I call The Science Delusion. You can check out part one of our series and listen to the foundation of what we're actually building upon. The grand premise of this series is that Secular science has lied to the general public for decades, and there's much more to this world than what's published. And I say secular science because there's an agenda behind what they're pushing, hence why they're not covering all of the facts. The bias does not allow truth to emerge because they're so focused on maintaining the status quo. In this part two, I want to talk about some concepts and truths about our universe. I want to share a lot of scripture and what God says, as well as compare it to what scientists say. In fact, I would guarantee that you'll be shocked at what modern science is saying about the universe and how it aligns with what God has been saying all along. And it's not quite what you think. It's almost like they're reading from the scripture itself or at least being controlled by the devils who actually know the truth. As science tries to steal the credit from what they have gotten from God, we start to see the truth emerge. It's important to point out that the grand creation of God is more complex and layered than we realize. Jesus tried to point this out to his apostles, but they didn't understand. We're going to point out in various scriptures what You have probably read before, but you've probably also glossed over it. But after this podcast, you're going to look at those scriptures a whole lot differently. I pray that your faith will be more strengthened through this series on the science of God. With that introduction, let's get right into this. Now, first thing is first. There have been various types of creation myths that have emerged throughout history, none of which resemble the account of the Bible. There emerged a theory by the Greek philosopher Aristotle around 300 BC in his writings called Physics. With this particular theory, he argued that the world must have existed eternally. He said that the underlying matter of the universe came into existence in some sort of substratum. He essentially argued that something cannot come into existence from nothing. This view was debated amongst the various philosophers through the centuries after that, and the Catholic Church later condemned that particular view, which is awfully ironic 
But around the 1150 AD mark, there was a Jewish philosopher named Moses Maimonides, and he wrote in great depth against the viewpoint of Aristotle. Maimonides said that, quote, Aristotle finds it as impossible to assume that God changes his will or conceives a new desire as to believe that he is non-existing or that his essence is, is changeable. Hence, it follows that this universe has always been the same in the past and will always be eternally. Now, you have to understand that he was writing against the emergence of Aristotelian philosophy. Instead, Mamnides contested that, quote, in the beginning, God alone existed and nothing else. Neither angels, nor spheres, nor the things that are contained within the spheres existed. He then produced from nothing all existing things such as they are by his will and desire. Even time itself is among the things created. For time depends upon motion, on an accident and thing which move, and the things upon whose motion time depends are themselves created beings for which have passed from non-existence into existence. We see that God existed before the creation of the universe, although the verb existed appears to imply the notion of time. We also believe that he existed an infinite space of time before the universe was created. But in these cases, we do not mean time itself in its true sense. We only use the term to signify something analogous or similar to time, we consider time a thing created. Now, I want you to think about what he said. This is in 1100 AD, 1150 or so AD. And he wrote about time itself being a thing. This is a, this was even a Christian. This was an, an Orthodox Jew. This is very important to realize because we're going to get more into this later in dealing with time. But he's writing what modern science had just figured out in the 1970s that time itself was a thing. Now, Christians also had believed this as well as the early church. Like I said, we'll get more into that later. But I find that extremely fascinating. He went on to say, quote, Aristotle, or rather his followers, may perhaps ask us how we know the universe had been created, that the other forces than those it has at present were acting in its creation. Since we hold that the properties of the universe, as it exists at the present, prove nothing as regards its creation, we reply, there is no necessity for, uh, for this according to our plan, for we do not desire to prove the creation, only its possibility. And this possibility is not refuted by arguments based upon the nature of the present universe, which we do not dispute. When we have established the ad admissibility of our theory, we shall then show its superiority. What he's trying to say is that we're trying to demonstrate that the scriptures and the God of the universe is not a part of this physical world. You could look at the events that take place in the creation of God, but that has nothing to do where God lives. Really begin to think about what Mamonides is saying. Remember, he lived around 1100 AD. Notice the time gap between Aristotle and Mamonides. You still had this debate going on about time and reality itself. Now, the philosopher Plato did contend with Aristotle, and his followers did after him. It was really only the Jews and the Christians who preached the one true God and it held firm through the entire time. Mamonides, over 800 years before Einstein, took the Bible at its word that God created the universe and the earth. This is important to note. Because as evolution got its foothold into Europe, the Aristotelian theory would just emerge even more to try to eliminate God. In 1915, a Jewish scientist by the name of Albert Einstein published his general theory, Relativity. He basically stated that the universe is made up of four dimensions, matter, energy, space, and time. Previous to this, time was not even considered a dimension. And then, of course, you had his famous E equals MC squared, which was formulated. What he was trying to say is time is not uniform. Time is a physical property. Time varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. And that we exist in more than three dimensions. In 1971, atomic clocks were sent different directions around the world. One clock gained time and the other lost time. 
Once this experiment was done, it pretty much set in stone the general theory of relativity. Albert Einstein said, quote, People like us who believe physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion, end quote. That's a fascinating statement when you look at what or how God acts throughout the Bible. And he talks about where the heaven of heavens is compared to the first and second heavens where man dwells. Take for a moment to think about this and what he's getting at. Gerald Schroeder, a Jewish nuclear scientist later on in the uh, 80s and 90s, said, quote, According to Einstein's law of relativity, we now know that it's impossible in an expanding universe to describe the elapsed time experienced during the sequence of events occurring in one part of the universe in a way that will be equal to the elapsed time those same events when viewed from another part of the universe. What he's saying here is that from his perspective of the Big Bang, if you're at the closest point to where the Big Bang supposedly happened compared to the the farthest point that you can get, time is not going to uh, elapse the same. It's going to be different. He continues on in his quote, The differences in motions and gravitational forces among the various galaxies or even among the stars of a single galaxy make the absolute passage of time a very local affair. Time differs from place to place. A billion cosmic clocks were and still are ticking each at its own locally correct rate. Each planet, each star, each location within our universe has its own unique gravitation potential, its own relative velocity, and therefore its own unique rate at which the local proper time elapses in its own age. Now, that's absolutely fascinating. Think about the planets or moons close to the Earth. Just take the sun, the Earth, and the moon. Time elapses differently because the gravitational forces, its mass and velocity, are all different between the three. The clock ticks differently there. I know that's very hard to grasp, especially amongst our Christian brethren. But if the, if the soonest that you can actually grasp this, there are various scriptures that will completely open up to you in its meaning. Science did not discover that time is a thing and relative. God had been saying this the entire time. It's just that we have bitten too much into this rationality of secular science that we don't think about these things. And it's very sad. And it's all throughout many different systematic theologies. Now, continuing on, according to the Earth's velocity, mass and gravity, think about this. How could you judge the so-called evolutionary standards as to how old the Earth is? Because its velocity, mass, and gravity are all relative. The moon's velocity, mass, and gravity would be different from the sun, like we said, previously said. You couldn't have the theory of evolution in millions of years because you couldn't date it in what you think or how you think you could date it because it's all relative. Now, <laughs> that, that gets into a completely different subject, but think about that. Given that time is now a thing and can be measured, science also noted that the laws of physics apply. The second law of thermodynamics, which is called entropy, Christians know it as the effects of sin, also is affecting time itself, and time itself is unraveling. Think about that. This is why the atomic clocks one in Boulder, Colorado, and the other in Greenwich, uh, UK, do not run in sync with each other because one is at a higher elevation and the other is below sea level. In a documentary called The Fabric of the Cosmos, MIT astrophysicist Max Tegmark and physicist Brian Greene state, quote, Entropy was less at the Big Bang, started out in an ordered state, and as the universe expands, Time itself will lose its meaning, end quote. To this point that they make, <laughs> as a Christian, I say, yeah, you're exactly right. There is going to come a point in which entropy or the effects of sin is going to unravel everything. <laughs> but anyways, it's a difference of worldviews. Once the general theory of relativity was sealed, 
the Aristotelian eternal universe model couldn't last. You have to understand this. The secular atheistic scientists of the 1970s, uh, before the 1970s, they held to the the steady state model or that the universe always was. And mind you, the theologians acted accordingly to having God correlate where the th heaven of heavens, the third heaven, correlates with heaven one and two or the atmosphere and the universe. They, they followed along the Aristotelian model. When the 1970s came along and you had the general theory of relativity uh, prove with the atomic clocks, you had <laughs> these secular scientists who they were very reluctant to give up the Aristotelian model, not because of science, but because it would give too much credence to the creationist. But soon they claim they, they decided to go ahead and claim this idea as their own and still make people who believe in God and creation uh, just a, a place of mockery. Before this time, when they believed the eternal universe, they mocked God believers for believing everything was created. Now they believe that the universe was created, yet creationists and God are still ridiculous in their eyes. That's amazing. <laughs> this is where we have the emergence of the Big Bang Theory as secularists are trying to counteract God at creating the universe. And some will be like, well, there was a Catholic who helped create the Big Bang Theory. Well, I still hold in my statement, secularists uh, counteract God creating the universe. Thus saith the Lord in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. <laughs> in the beginning, God created time, space, and matter. Science just revealed what God had said from the very beginning. As stated previously, early theologians did not believe that God dwelled within time itself. Sometimes when reading the scriptures, one can forget that the Lord of the universe dwells in eternity and not where man dwells. What do I mean? Isaiah 57 and verse 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. The scripture sets out several verses that support this notion, not only from Isaiah 57, 15, but also Habakkuk 113, which says, quote, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. End quote. The entire universe is marred with sin and set towards destruction. Science calls this the second law of thermodynamics, or entropy. This is why stars explode and even time itself is unraveling. The scripture plainly depicts the situation of the universe and why it's doing what it's doing as sin entering the world. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. If God hates sin and cannot even look upon sin, then how is the heaven of heavens, the third heaven, even contained anything relative to to the first and second heavens, which are marred by sin. The heaven of heavens, which is perfect, does not dwell within the first or near the first and second heavens. Now, we have to understand that the Old Testament believers and prophets understood that God was outside of time. The early church understood this as well. But the fall of the Roman Empire changed everything because Europe itself collapsed into chaos. And that kind of knowledge was forgotten for a while. The teachings of Aristotle and the eternal universe emerged again through Thomas Aquinas. And then the reformers, a couple hundred years later, would build upon God being within time later. And you can say, well, how do you think that the reformers could even teach that God is a part of our time? Well, it's built into their theology, hence why systematic theology such as Calvinism and Arminianism have issues and flaws because they have the God of the universe, the God that lives, lives in the heaven of heavens lined up in time with us. And that causes problems in their systematic theology. Getting a view of eternity in a rough concept can help us get a glimpse of how God interacts with man. Science has confirmed what God has already stated in his word, the fact that time itself is a thing. Here are some other scriptures to, to take into consideration about this.
Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, but verse 1 says, To every thing there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And the verses that come right after all have a point in time that he's talking about. He's making an emphasis about time itself. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6 says, quote, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that are therein, and the earth, and the things that are that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, and there should be time no longer. Very fascinating that he puts it that particular way. If God is outside of time, then this makes communication with man difficult at times because God is outside our normal scope of human understanding. We think of God in eternity as some sort of, you know, somebody with a lot of time because we think of eternity where there's no time, where he just has a lot of time <laughs> in the relative sense that we use that word. But that's not quite the way that we should look at it. This always makes things very interesting when God tries to explain things to us in his word about heavenly subjects. But it's really hard for our finite minds to grasp. The apostles who were around Jesus had a hard time grasping these types of things. Even Paul or John, uh, who saw heavenly things, had a hard time communicating what they saw. How do we wrap our minds around the fact that time itself is a physical thing as it's almost incomprehensible? What we're living in right now is a thing. It's it's not like you can touch it necessarily, but you can in a way, and it's measured. Paul Davies, who is a well-known astrophysicist, stated, quote, Western culture can't seem to divest itself of the belief in the existence of time as an independently real entity, God-given and absolute. People can accept clocks may do funny things, but that the human mind may play tricks? Hmm. They don't want to attribute such phenomena to time itself, only to the way we experience or measure time, end quote. This also enlightens us in other areas of scripture that once seemed fuzzy, but the applying of this principle uh, will really help you begin to lift the haze upon various scriptures. I did a podcast, uh, Abraham's, Where is Abraham's Bosom? And this type of concept also applies in how we look at heaven and hell. It's very interesting. Instead of thinking of time as a line, think of it more of a 3D line. God sees past, present, and future because he is outside of time. Think of the Apostle John when he went outside of his body and was taken up to heaven, the third heaven, the heaven of heavens, and he was shown the future. I want you to think about this. Think about what, if you if you could imagine yourself standing next to Christ in, in the description that the Bible gives, and he's showing you the future. Now, ponder this. Not only did the Apostle John get taken up to the third heaven where God lives, he was shown Christ's return. Christ is with him, showing himself coming back in the future. Not only that, the creation of a new heaven and new earth. Remember, he's in the heaven of heavens, and he's being shown the earth and the old earth and universe being burnt up and the new heaven and new earth being created. Now think about that one for a moment. God being outside of time makes you think about the next logical conclusion about death. Could it be that the first person who died, which was Abel, to the last person to die before the rapture could theoretically meet Jesus at the same, pun intended, time? They close their eyes in death and then meet Christ in the rapture? Because once you close your eyes in death, you are no longer physical. You then become spiritual. You are no longer a part of this time. Well, that's very interesting. If we set aside our theological presuppositions, this idea isn't far-fetched. And sure, there's no heresy involved anyways. This universe is more complex and layered than we think. God has been telling us this all along, but somehow we keep missing it in the scriptures. Given the dimensionality of the universe, 
This explains the reason for various events in Scripture. I want you to think about this. The book of Numbers, chapter 22, verse 21 through 34, and 2 Kings, chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, talk about different people who, in fact, aren't able to see angels that were there all along. And then it was revealed to them by God that the angels had been there, and there was a story that goes along with it. The fact that the angels were operating in a different dimension, so to say, in the scientific definition of it, it shows that there's more layers to this universe and God's creation than our rationalistic minds try to make of it. And that's the problem. Remember what I said. We are too rationalistic. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 24 and verse 31, Jesus appears to the disciples. It says, quote, and their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Vanished. They just become invisible. No, he just phased through. If you think of scientific terms, phased through time to go someplace else. Later in verse 36, it says, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, peace be unto you. Now, that's kind of funny because they're having a meeting and then Jesus just, boop, appears. <laughs> that's crazy in the relative sense anyways. The Bible goes on to make this point after the resurrection in John chapter 20 and verse 26. After eight days again, his disciples were with him or were within and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus and the Bible emphasizes this here. The doors being shut, comma, and stood in the midst, Jesus with the doors being shut, appeared in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. That's fascinating scripture. So you could just read right through that, but not pick up some of the subtleties the scriptures are putting off there. He appeared and the doors were shut. Now, the Bible is definitely not boring. And so when you come to understand the stories in scripture and the events that take place, it makes you just go, Wow, God is truly amazing. And there's some pretty fascinating things in here. How about stretching the heavens? God describes in many places that the heavens themselves can be stretched. Not the heaven of heavens. Remember, there are three heavens. The first heaven is the atmosphere, talked about in Genesis. Then you have the second heaven, which is the universe. God never talks about the creation of the heaven of heavens, ever. That means Mammonides is wrong, and any theologian that tells you that Genesis 1-1 talks about the creation of the heaven of heavens, the Bible does not say that. It only talks about the second heaven, which is the universe, and later on in Genesis, it talks about the creation of the first heaven, which is the atmosphere. In context, that word Shemayim, or heaven, it becomes is singular in Genesis 1-1, and then becomes plural in Genesis 2-1. That's very, very important to understand your Bible. The heaven of heavens, where God lives, is never talked about being created, period. Look it up. Now, the first and second heavens is talked about being able to be stretched. That's fascinating. It can be stretched. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 10. Job chapter 9 and verse 8 says this, quote, which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. You see this type of idea again in chapter 26 and verse uh, 7, chapter 37 and verse 18. The book of Psalms has three uh, relative scriptures to this. Uh, chapter 18 and verse 9, Psalm 104 and verse 2, which says, quote, Who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain. End quote. Then you have Psalm 144 and verse 5. Isaiah has several scriptures. Chapter 40, verse 22, 42, verse 5, 44, verse 24, 45, verse 12, 48, 13. Then, of course, there's Jeremiah, chapter 10, verse 12, 51, verse 15. Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 22. Zechariah, 12, 1. Pretty fascinating stuff when you read your Bible and you understand the words that are being used. One thing to understand is that space is just not an empty vacu vacuum. Space itself, as the Bible is, talks about, can be torn. Think about that. Space itself can be torn. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, and verse 1, it says, quote, 
Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens or tear the heavens, that thou wouldest come down and the mountains might flow down at thy presence. End quote. This is quite an interesting thought. Remember when the book of Isaiah was written because physicists, secular physicists are trying to do this very thing now. There were those who believed that they can use powerful lasers and other methods to tear space itself. Now that kind of sounds like a plot for a Hollywood movie, you know, Hollywood scary movie or something, but <laughs> all, all kidding aside, it isn't really that far fetched because God said it could be torn. Wow. Scientists probably won't achieve it, but it's fascinating that God could even say this type of thing thousands of years ago through his prophets. And yet here we are today, not really believing the full word of God. And just what? Believing scientists and what they say. It's so sad. Even Christians. It says that space itself can be worn out like a garment. Psalm 102 and verse 25 says that. It can be shaken. Isaiah 13 verse 13. Haggai verse 2 or chapter 2 verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 26. It can be burnt up. Now this is an important verse. It's found in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, quote, Looking for and hasting into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's talking about the destruction of the first and second heavens. Space itself can be split apart like a scroll. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 14 talks about that. It can be rolled up. Isaiah 34 and verse 4 and Hebrews 1 and verse 12. Now, those are just a few, and I gave you a lot of scriptures, I know, but that's just a few of the scriptures that we can talk about in dealing with this. I, I didn't even read them all. In just dealing with this foundational concept of so-called randomness, it totally dismantles the naturalistic thought of evolution. There's no such thing as random processes because everything is calculated. Everything. <laughs> it was the unbeliever, the heathen, Albert Einstein, that said, quote, God does not play dice, because if he did, he win. <laughs> the philosophy of secular science is that we are nothing but cosmic space dust that just sprung up over billions of years and that we're not important. Secular college professors would tell students every day that we're nothing but a grain of sand in the universe. We're nothing special in the universe. We're just a small blue dot in the universe. We're just walking bags of bacteria. <laughs> that last one's funny. True quote, by the way. We have to have an understanding as to what the scripture is saying and not input our own thoughts. This can be very dangerous as many today are looking to explain every single aspect of the Bible. And you know what? Everything cannot be explained because we do have our finite minds. And you know what? Hey, it's okay. It's okay to say, I don't know. Because guess what? <laughs> the secular world doesn't have the answers either. So if you can't explain how time exactly works in relative to the Bible, that's okay. Because most unbelievers can't do it either. To include the ones actually studying it, it confounds them. With the information age of the internet and how knowledge is so accessible, it's getting harder and harder for these unbeliever heathen to conceal the truth for that much longer. And this is definitely why we developed the science delusion uh, aspect of the podcast, where to be able to just give you bits and pieces for you to study on your own and to help build your faith in God and that he truly is who he says that he is. I want to thank you for listening. And be sure to follow us on the podcast media. Please take a look at our website, OurMightyFortress.com, and subscribe for more updates. Stay tuned next time for more great content, and remember to find your refuge and strength in Our Mighty Fortress.